own health care decisions, which is being threatened by a runaway, radical, right-wing Supreme Court majority. That's shameful, uh, and we're going to fight, and we're going to fight, and we're going to fight, and we're going to win to protect the woman's freedom, to make her own health care decisions between herself and her doctor, not a runaway Supreme Court. And of course, we continue to stand on the side of Ukraine to fight for their freedom in a battle between freedom and tyranny, a battle between democracy and dictatorship, a battle between truth and propaganda. So we advanced a robust aid package yesterday, military assistance, economic assistance, humanitarian assistance, to continue to stand with Ukraine against the Russian aggression that is so devastating to the Ukrainian people, but we're thankful for their spirit, their resolve, their resilience, and House Democrats, unlike many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, House Democrats will continue to stand with Ukraine. It's now my honor to yield to our distinguished Vice Chair, Pete Aguilar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief uh, this morning. I've got two appropriations hearings, and I've got to get uh, to Secretary Fudge, our former colleague, and uh, the others with uh, Secretary Austin and Chairman Milley. House Democrats, as the chairman mentioned, are in shock and frustration over the decision overturning Roe and eliminating access to abortion for millions of women. I've not lived in an America where Roe v. Wade was not the law of the land. For 50 years, it's been a fundamental right in this country for women to have control of their own bodies and to make their own health care decisions. I'm deeply concerned that we could see women and doctors jailed for seeking or providing an abortion. I fear that the result of this radical Supreme Court decision would not just hurt women, but it would be a devastating blow to those of us who believe in the rule of law, who believe that there are limits to how much the government can encroach in our personal lives, and who believe in safe and affordable access to care is a basic right. I'll turn it over now to my colleague and fellow Californian and the author of the House bill. Uh, she's a leader on these issues for decades and sponsor of the Women's Health Protection Act, Congresswoman Judy Chu. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Aguilar, and thank you, Chair Jeffries, for inviting me to join you here this morning. Last week, a bomb was dropped on the American people when the draft decision was released showing that five justices were for ending Roe versus Wade. Immediately, I thought about the millions of women that would be affected, whose choice for their futures would be deprived from them. I thought about our own colleagues, Congress member Cori Bush, who was 17 when she was raped and had an abortion. Congressmember Pramila Jayapal, whose pregnancy would have ended her life and decided to have an abortion. I thought about Congressmember Jackie Spear, who at 17 weeks pregnancy found that her fetus was coming out of the uterus and decided to have an abortion. I thought about all the women in all 50 states who had this right for 50 years, who would have this choice taken away from them. So that is why I did introduce the Women's Health Protection Act. I could see that this right was being eroded since 2013 by the different states. And now this day has come. The House was ready. Immediately in September, the House passed this bill by 218 to 211. It was the most supported pro-choice bill in the history of Congress. So we passed it in the House. President Biden has said he would sign this bill, but we need the Senate. Thankfully, Leader Schumer has put it on the floor for a vote. We need the Senate to act. We do know there are 49 senators who are Democrats who are for this bill. We do know that there are two Republican senators that are pro-choice. We call on them 
to do the right thing and vote for this bill. But if they do not, I can tell you something. Today is not the end. Today is just the beginning. Today, we start the march towards the November elections. And in fact, today is the start of the galvanization of all women in this country and the men who support them. That's why we will march this weekend in support of abortion rights. We will march for the right to make decisions about our own bodies, and we will march to the polls this November to protect the rights of every person in every state for their right to an abortion. Thank you, Judy, for your extraordinary leadership at such a critical moment in time for the American people, for women, uh, and for the cause of freedom. Uh, I now yield to the distinguished co-chair, a longtime leader uh, in the fight to protect a woman's right and ability, their freedom to make their own health care decisions, uh, Diana DeGette. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chair Jeffries. The House has done its job, as my colleague Judy Chu said. We, for the first time in 2018, the House had a pro-choice majority. And so when we got a pro-choice Democrat in the White House in 2020, we decided it was time to tell the American public exactly where we stood on making sure that every woman in this country has the ability to make the full range of health care decisions, including an abortion. And so, as Judy said, we were ready. We had been working on this for a long time. And so within days after the Supreme Court's first decision on the Texas case, we brought her Women's Health Protection Act, which would put Roe versus Wade into law for everybody in this country, not just some states. We put it on the floor. And as she said, we passed it 218 to 211. Also, in this last fiscal year, we're working with Chair Rosa DeLauro. We took all of the Hyde restrictions that say there's no public funding for abortion out of the appropriations bills for the first time in history. The House is pro-choice. We have a pro-choice majority, and we need to keep it that way because we need to have a backstop against the extreme legislative efforts that we're going to see. I joined my colleagues in saying the Senate needs to pass the Women's Health Protection Act but if they don't, the House is there, number one, to make sure that these extreme pieces of legislation limiting health care choices don't go through, and to make sure that the people of America understand how very, very, very real the danger is to them. And look, Judy's right. People have assumed for almost 50 years now that they could make their health care decisions. They now know that the radical Supreme Court and the Republican majority has no intention to let that happen. And what we are about to see is a have and have not situation where half the states let women have their full rights and half restrict them. Just the other day, I was in Houston, Texas, and I was talking to a doctor down there Already, the Texas law has gone into effect, and he told me about a woman who um, who had an unwanted pregnancy, and she wanted to schedule an abortion, but she couldn't do it in Texas. So she waited until she had a trip, a previously tri scheduled trip out of Texas, so that she could do it both at the same time. When she got there, it turned out she had an ectopic pregnancy that was pretty far along. And if she had been able to get the care she needed in Texas, she could have taken care of this earlier. But as it was, <clears throat> it was a miracle that she didn't die. It was a miracle that she didn't die. We're going to see millions. <clears throat> We're going to see millions of cases like this if we don't protect a woman's right to her medical treatment, including abortion.
thank you, Representative DeGette. Thank you, Representative Chu, uh, for your leadership. I also want to acknowledge and thank uh, Representative Barbara Lee, who also is a co-chair of the Pro-Choice Caucus, for her leadership. Questions? Mm -hmm. Hi, Congressman. To all of you, will there be any votes on any other abortion-related measures, such as um, protecting exceptions of rape and incest or contraception or anything like that? I know the House already passed it, but is there anything else that the House will do? Well, I'm going to yield to Diana and Judy, but um, as both of our leaders mentioned, the House has done its job. Uh, we're thankful for the vision, the foresight, the leadership of Representative Chu, who introduced this legislation years ago because she saw exactly what was coming. Uh, and we were able to move the legislation through the House. We don't want to let the Senate off the hook today. The Senate has a job to do, including senators on the Republican side of the aisle who profess to be pro-choice who profess to support a woman's freedom to make her own health care decisions, the senator from Maine and the senator from Alaska. Let's see what they do today. And then we'll see what the legislative landscape is that we confront after the Senate weighs in. Yeah. We don't have anything to add. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chairman, can I ask you, um, you know, uh, Representative Chu and Representative DeGette, you both mentioned that um, you have a pro-choice majority in the House. Uh, there are only 49 Democratic senators um, in the Senate who uh, say that they support the House pass bill. Is there room in your party? We obviously have two people, um, Senator Manchin and Representative Cuellar. Is there room in your party anymore for members who are not pro-choice? Well, I'm going to yield to yeah. you want me Diana. To yeah. so, so over the years, for uh, because of their personal religious beliefs, we have had a number of women who or a number of members of the Democratic caucus who were not pro-choice. And um, and uh, over the years, what has happened after they talked to their constituents and and real, a number of them, Judy, you've probably talked to them, too. I've talked to a number of these folks and they have searched their souls and they realized that their public duties to full health care for their constituents, they shouldn't be imposing their personal religious beliefs on their public duties. But there's always room in our party for people who have all different personal beliefs. And and um, it just so happens that these folks are listening to their constituents. I would just say, look at Senator Casey. Casey has a, he has a personal a religious belief about abortion, but he has decided he is going to vote for this bill because he knows that this should be a decision made between a woman and her doctor, that this is a private decision. And Senator Casey should not be making that decision for that woman, nor should Marco Rubio or Ted Cruz. It should be a decision made by that woman, and that is what Senator Casey is respecting. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Jeffries, on Congressman Cuellar, um, how do you defend to abortion rights supporters your continued support for him, given that he was the one Democrat to vote against the Women's Health Protection Act, and given that it's a Democratic district, he has a pro-choice challenger, why is supporting incumbents more important than abortion rights? Uh, I have a 100% uh, record when it comes to supporting reproductive freedom, going all the way back to my time in the legislature. I've served uh, in public office for 16 years. My record speaks for itself. I'm uh, wondering if you have any reaction to the inflation numbers today, 8.3% year over year and 0.3% month over month. Any thoughts on that? Well, as President Biden has indicated, uh, we are going to work and focus like a laser beam on dealing with the inflationary pressures that the American people are experiencing in terms of food prices, uh, certainly in terms of gas prices, and every other day-to-day uh, -day kitchen table pocketbook issue that Democrats work on, Republicans talk about, 
but do nothing about. And as my grandmother used to say, the proof is in the pudding. And if you look at the Biden record on the economy, he inherited one that was on the brink of complete and total collapse, perhaps an economic circumstance worse than the Great Recession. Had Democrats uh, not acted decisively, but with President Biden's leadership, Speaker Pelosi, Leader Schumer, Judy Chu, Democrats on both sides of the Capitol, we acted decisively. We passed the American Rescue Plan. We saved the economy, put money in pockets, shots in arms, kids back in school, and laid the foundation for a strong economic recovery. More than 8 million good paying jobs created during President Biden's first 16 months in office, a record. Fastest rate of economic growth in 40 years. Unemployment down to pre-pandemic lows of 3.6%. Wages have increased for the first time in 40 years in a meaningful way. And all of that was accomplished uh, by also reducing the deficit by more than $350 billion in President Biden's first year. We're on track for a deficit reduction to exceed a trillion dollars this year. So yes, there's more work that needs to be done. President Biden has already indicated that we're focused on doing the work, lowering costs for everyday Americans, and Democrats will continue to deliver. <clears throat> COVID aid package um, is going to start in the House now um, after it stalled out in the Senate and was separated from Ukraine. Uh, do you expect that supplemental to be a House Democratic product or a Four Corners negotiation? And how soon do you think it could get moving to the floor? Well, you know, I think that question is probably best answered by Speaker Pelosi. We always endeavor uh, to find common ground, have a um, Four Corners agreement whenever and wherever possible. Certainly in the Senate, that is necessary in order to get something over the finish line because of their particularized rules. Uh, in the House, uh, certainly we always hope that our colleagues will join with us on the other side of the aisle to decisively act to continue to try to crush the COVID virus and end this pandemic once and for all in a meaningful way. Uh, but that remains to be seen what my colleagues on the other side of the aisle will do, but we certainly will need a, some form of bipartisan agreement eventually emerging from the Senate. Go back to this side. The party's been very clear it's important to hold this vote because you want to get everybody on the record and um, as, as Congresswoman Chu said, it, it's also a way to show your voters, mobilize them, show that you were fighting back. To what extent do you think holding this vote might have the opposite effect and maybe be demoralizing because it is a reminder of the limits of your narrow majority? Yeah, thanks for the question. I'm going to yield to Judy Chu, who's the champion of this legislation. I think, if anything, it will galvanize the voters. I don't see it being uh, uh, something that will suppress them. It will activate them more to see how important it is to get involved in the elections, which are just around the corner. And in fact, primaries are occurring all over the place. Uh, already, candidates are being asked about their abortion stand. I've seen a total change in the way the elections are being processed, even as of this last week. And this is on not just the federal level, it's on the state and the local level. In my state of California, they decided immediately to put a constitutional amendment on the ballot to uphold the right to an abortion. So it's changed the landscape totally, and I expect more of these kinds of decisions and changes to go on moving forward. And every candidate now is having to decide how they will answer the question of choice. And it's going to be very, very interesting, especially in the seats that are um, swing seats. And I just add the fight to uh, preserve the constitutional protections that are in Roe v. Wade had been settled law and precedent, even according to many of the now justices who apparently have changed their position, first opportunity they've gotten. This is a fight for liberty, it's a fight for freedom, it's a fight for democracy. And whenever we've been in fights like that in the past, we don't always get the decisive result initially. But you continue to make progress, march toward a more perfect union, and eventually get there. 
The first time civil rights legislation uh, was brought to the floor was not in 1964 with the 1964 Civil Rights Act. That wasn't the first time civil rights legislation was brought to the floor. There was a concerted effort to build up to that moment, often led by former Congressman Adam Clayton Powell, who tried and tried and tried again. Eventually, they got there. Hopefully, we can get it done today in the Senate. But even if we don't, it's not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end. It's only the end of the beginning of a fight that we will win to protect a woman's freedom to make her own health care decisions. Last question. Thank you. Um, the Senate on Monday passed unanimously a bill that would provide uh, additional protections to the families of Supreme Court justices amid these protests over Roe. Um, are you supportive of that legislation, one, and is there a plan to bring it to the floor in the House? Yeah, I haven't seen the legislation uh, yet. Look forward to reviewing it. Uh, Steny did not bring it up today in terms of uh, pending legislation that's before the House this week. I assume the appropriate committee will review it, uh, make their recommendations, decide how to act, perhaps refer it out, and then the caucus will have an opportunity to decide what to do with it then. Do you think it's justified? Is it merited based on I haven't the reviewed the uh, legislation, but I certainly think that all public servants, people who step forward, whether you're in the Article I legislative branch, the Article II executive branch, the Article III uh, judicial branch, uh, deserve to make sure that their safety and security, particularly of that of their families, uh, are protected. And so uh, we'll have an opportunity to review the particulars of the legislation. I haven't, uh, but I certainly support the notion uh, that public servants should be protected in the strongest way possible at all times. If anyone believes in that, it's House Democrats who were almost overrun by a violent mob of insurrectionists on January 6th. If anyone believes in that, it's us. But we'll take a look at the particulars of the legislation and then decide how to act. Thank you, Judy, for your tremendous leadership. Thank you, everyone.